here to look after the health of our minds, because the mind has a tendency to develop diseases. There's a passage in the Udana where the Buddha, after his awakening, surveys the world, and he sees everybody on fire with the fevers of passion, aversion, and delusion. So when we talk about the diseases of the mind here, we're not talking about the kind of diseases that would throw you into a mental institution. They're diseases that everybody is born with. And the mind has these, it's like it carries these germs around inside. Or we might look at it as a lack of resistance to disease. It doesn't have its immune system up. And as a result, it just catches fire, catches these diseases. When the stimuli come in from the eyes, ears, nose, tongue, and body. And as you know, if you know anything about medicine, we live in a world full of germs. It's only when our resistance is down that the germs can take hold. And it's the same with the mind. And there are all sorts of things out there that would spark passion, aversion, and delusion. But it's only when our resistance is down that these things actually come into the mind and take over. There are times when you can look at something really beautiful and feel no passion at all, when events can be really bad and there's no aversion. It's a sign that your resistance is, is on a high level. Your immune system is working. So the cure the Buddha offers is a double one. Just as a stopgap measure, he says, okay, practice restraint of the senses, so you don't take in too many germs from outside. He says, if you notice that there are details that you focus on that get the mind all worked up, well, just don't focus on those details. Many times we hear restraint of the senses, and it sounds like we've got to put blinders on. We're not allowed to look, we're not allowed to listen. And of course, there's all sorts of repressed things suddenly can come boiling up. That's the image we have. But that's not what the Buddha was talking about. He says, watch for the details. What are the little things that get you set off? Because oftentimes that's just what it is. It's the little details. And it's because you focus on the details and not on the whole thing that the mind can get a lopsided or unbalanced response. So if something that seems beautiful and looks like it's getting, give, giving rise to passion, okay, look at its unbeautiful side. That's why we have that contemplation of the 32 parts of the body almost every morning as an antidote. That's for things that get you angry. Okay, People who get you angry or situations that get you angry, look on the good side. Look for the good details. Don't focus on the details that get you upset. Because again, it's from a lopsided view. Or as John Lee says, it's because you look at things with only one eye, you listen with only one ear. So you see only one side of the situation. And as you're looking at both sides, okay, that that helps get rid of delusion. So that's the stopgap measures, restraint of the senses. And you find if you really are diligent in practicing it, it gets a lot easier to practice meditation. The problems we have in the course of the day that we leave our mind on a long leash and let it get involved in all kinds of stuff. Then when the time comes to meditate, it's like a dog on a long leash. You've got to pull here and unwrap it. As the dog has gotten wound around the lamppost, wound around a bench, wound around all kinds of stuff. By the time you've unwound it, the meditation session is over. In the meantime, it hasn't just got wound around things, it's also picked up all kinds of germs. And you've got to sit here treating it, because it's picked up a lot of unnecessary stuff. But if you find that you really do exercise restraint over the senses, and notice, okay, when the mind is getting worked up in any of those directions, and you counter it immediately. That's developing mindfulness and alertness right there. So you're strengthening your immune system at the same time that you're keeping germs from coming in. Now as for the immune system, the things that are called anusaya, and it's one of those poly terms that's really difficult to translate. Sometimes it's called latent tendency because literally it means 
saya means to lie down, and the note means to be with or following. But you look at the way it's used in the text, it's more like obsession. In other words, your thoughts keep lying down with this particular object, this particular pattern. There are particular types of obsessions that you have. And these are the things that cause trouble. There's a passage where the Buddha says, say for instance, when pain comes, the pain itself is not all that big an issue. But as soon as there's pain, there's the obsession of resistance. You get obsessed with resisting the pain. And then you start looking for an escape. And because for most people the only escape from pain is sensual pleasure, that's where you go looking. You want to find some sort of sensual pleasure to cover up the pain, get rid of the pain, push it away. Okay, once the sensual pleasure comes, then you get there's the obsession of passion. You get obsessed with passion for that pleasure. That's something you really want to counteract the pain, to protect you from the pain. And as for delusion, okay, that's that usually centers around feelings that are neither pleasant nor painful, kind of neutral feelings. You don't pay much attention to them, you don't really see them, because you're out looking for the pleasure and trying to push away the pain. So the neutral feelings seem kind of unimportant. And so a lot of delusion comes into the mind right at that point. That's where the Buddha says the ignorance obsession of the mind tends to focus. And so these obsessions circle around the pain. And it's these obsessions, those are the problems with your immune system. Because the immune system of the mind doesn't work quite like the body. There has to be an understanding that you have alternatives to the way you ordinarily react to, say, pain or pleasure. The texts talk about three ways. There's, there's the, I've forgotten the name of the sutta, but it's the one where Wisaka, layperson, layman, asks his ex-wife, who's now a nun, some questions on the Dharma. And after she explains these three obsessions, resistance, passion, ignorance. He says, okay, does every feeling of pleasure have a passion obsession? Is there a resistance obsession with every feeling of pain or dis-ease? Is there ignorance obsession with every feeling of neither pleasure nor pain? And she says, no. And she goes on to explain. You can focus on the pleasure of the first jhana. And she says, the passion obsession doesn't come in there. It's a different kind of interest, a different kind of attachment. There is attachment to that state, but it's not quite the same. It's a kind of attachment you have to sensual objects. It actually builds up your resistance to those obsessions. The desire for awakening, she says, even though it's maybe unpleasant to think about how far you have to go or how much you want to be awakened and you're not awakened yet, she said it's still a useful, unpleasant feeling. A lot of people say, oh, don't get, let yourself have the desire for awakening because you're going to make yourself miserable. Just sort of be content with where you are. Well, that's not how the Buddha taught. He says, if you don't have the desire to awaken, how are you going to awaken? You can't, when you're shooting a gun, you can't hit higher than you aim. So you've got to have that aim. But it's a useful sense of dis-ease, a useful sense of something's got to be done, something that's quite right yet. But it's in the course of that useful disease, okay, there is no res there's no obsession or re resistance. So that helps break this cycle of these dis these obsessions. As for the ignorance obsession that tends to hang around neutral feelings, okay, so you can cut through that with the with the fourth jhana. And the mind settles down to a state of neither pleasure nor pain, total equanimity, purity of equanimity and mindfulness, it's called. It's called. Okay, there's no ignorance obsession there. So these obsessions that set, circle around pleasure and pain can be cut when you realize that there are alternative ways of dealing with these things. When there's pain in the body, you can still find a way of giving rise to jhana. You focus on the parts of the body that are comfortable, that are at ease. Then you maximize that sense of ease. It gets either, the, either to the point where the physical pain goes away, or even if it's still there, it doesn't matter. You've got a better place to be. 
which at the same time doesn't have the drawbacks of sensual pleasures. And that sets you on the, on the path to cutting those other obsessions as well. So the work here is twofold, just as it is when you're trying to protect the body from a disease. On the one hand, you don't expose the body to more germs than it has to be exposed to. And then secondly, you build up your resistance, strengthen your resistance, strengthen your immune system. And the mind's immune system starts with the practice of jhana, the practice of good, solid concentration. So you can cut through those obsessions. Because if you don't cut through those, as the Buddha said in his sutta on the, the two arrows, say there's pain in the body. It's like being shot with one arrow. Then these other obsessions get involved with the pain, and it's like shooting yourself with another arrow. Although for most of us, it's not a second arrow, it's a third, fourth, fifth, lots of arrows get shot there, right in the mind, over one little pain. It's even worse over big pains. In other words, the germ gets in and it just takes over. So you build up your resistance through the practice. And ultimately, when, when discernment finally breaks through, say to the ultimate level, then, then you can go wherever you want and no germs can touch you, because your immune system is totally in control. Until that point, you have to be careful, working both on the outer level and in the inner level. But when you work on the two of them together, okay, that's when you get the best results. Your mind gets a better and better sense of what it means to be really healthy, to have a real sense of well-being in the mind, no matter what happens. Because you know the basic principles of looking after the mind's health. After all, the Buddha said he was a doctor for the mind. This is the kind of medicine he practiced. Not where he cures our diseases, but where he, he tells us how to cure our own diseases. Which is what we're doing right now. <laughs>